Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of Species Shorts, coming to you from outside of my house because it is finally warm enough in Wisconsin to do this. My name is Lindsay Barone, for those of you who haven't met me yet, and I am an anthropologist that works occasionally with the DNA Learning Center. Now, this week in Species Shorts, we are getting closer and closer to anatomically modern humans. So we're not only talking about geographical proximity, but we're talking about temporal proximity. So we're getting closer to the time when modern humans evolved. We're also getting anatomically closer. So the species that we're going to be talking about this week, and in particular today, tend to have a lot of anatomical similarities with our own species. Now the species we're focusing on in today's class is Homo erectus. And this is one of my absolute favorite species to talk about. Um, and we'll get into why I like Homo erectus so much, but there's a lot of really unique things about it. Not only that, but we have a lot of examples of Homo erectus from the fossil record. And so we know a lot about it. And it gives us some really interesting insights into how humans evolved the way that they did. So to start things off, of course, I'd like you all to take a good look at the fossil. So I've got an example Homo erectus right here. This is a specimen from East Africa. So this is its face. Just make some observations about it, what it looks like, especially compared to our own faces and some of the earlier fossils that we've talked about in this series. This is the top of its head. You'll notice that it doesn't have that sagittal crest that we talked about with Philanthropus last week. This is what it looks like from the back of the skull. And then finally, this is the underside of the skull. So right here is the face, and this is the backside of the skull. And you can see, of course, we've talked a lot about teeth. Here's the tooth row, um, and here is the foramen magnum, and it might be a little bit dark to see, um, but that anterior foramen magnum that allows for bipedalism. So let's talk a little bit generally about what we know about Homo erectus. Homo erectus as a species was actually first discovered in Indonesia um, by an anatomist, uh, a Dutch anatomist, I believe, named Eugene Dubois. Uh, for a very long time, people thought that Southeast Asia was going to be the quote-unquote cradle of humanity. And so a lot of people were starting to look in this area of the world. Um, and for a very long time, nothing had really been discovered until the discovery of the first known Homo erectus specimen, um, which was originally given the name Pithecanthropus erectus. So right off the bat, if you've been watching all of our different episodes, this should clue you in that this species is way different than the other ones because everything we've talked about up until this point in time has only been found in Africa. So we're starting to see a species that is already really dispersed. This specimen that I held up was found in Eastern Africa, but like I just said, the first known erectus specimen was found in Indonesia. So already, two continents we've got this species on. And in fact, we find examples of Homo erectus into parts of Europe, into the Middle East, in Asia, and all over Africa. So we find Homo erectus all over this area of the world. This is the first species that migrates the way that we do. You know, we as a species are very migratory. We live essentially on all seven continents, even though technically nobody classically inhabits Antarctica. There are researchers down there most of the year. Um, so we've got people living all over the world. Homo erectus starts to do this as well. And that's one of the reasons why I find this such a fascinating species. Now, in terms of time, when did Homo erectus live? Um, roughly speaking, Homo erectus lived from about 1.8 to 2 million years ago, just all the way forward until between, let's say, 250,000 to 500,000 years ago. So over a million years, 
we're finding examples of Homo erectus in the hominin fossil record. Really, really widespread in terms of time, really widespread in terms of geography. Now, what does Homo erectus actually look like? Well, from the neck down, this is a species that looks very similar to our own. Um, it's got a really long, slender torso, very long legs, starting to develop a longitudinal arch in the foot. So if you look at your own feet, you'll notice that you probably have some degree of an arch, so it's kind of got this curved shape. Um, we see this in Homo erectus. We're starting to see wider joints that are good for supporting upright bipedalism. Um, we're starting to see shorter arms, which we talked about a little bit last week with Homo habilis, but is also the case with Homo erectus. Um, we're also seeing a very flat face. So you'll remember that over the last few episodes, we've talked a little bit about facial prognathism, which is when you have a species that has a face, a lower facial area that really sticks out from the rest of the skull. You can see with Homo erectus that this is pretty much gone. The face is pretty flat. And actually, I have a human skull right here too. I'll hold them up side by side. It's a little trickier though because the human skull is kind of big. Doing it one-handed is a challenge. There we go. You can see that they've almost got the same degree of facial prognathism, which is not much. Homo erectus has a slightly more sticking out lower face area, um, but it's not entirely huge. It's not like what we saw with, say, Sahelanthropus chadensis or Paranthropus ethiopicus. Another thing that we see with Homo erectus um, is something called a sagittal heel. So we've talked a little bit about the sagittal crest, which is a bony crest that runs from front to back on top of the skull, and it's an attachment area for the temporalis muscle. So we don't have a sagittal crest, you can see right here. Homo erectus also doesn't have a sagittal crest, but it does have something in that same area called a sagittal keel. And so it runs from front to back, and it's this really thick area of bone. Um, it's a little unclear why erectus has this, but it is something that is very, very common in this species for kind of unclear reasons. Um, in terms of the teeth, we've talked a lot about teeth so far in these other episodes, and of course, we can't skip them now. Um, Homo erectus is starting to have very small, very human-like teeth, so generalized teeth that aren't highly specialized for any particular kind of diet, smaller molars that aren't necessarily as big and huge um, as some of the other Australopithecines, for example. Um, we've also, st we're starting to see a tooth row that's getting wider as you move back. So it's starting to have more of a parabolic shape to the jaw. It's not quite perfectly there yet, um, especially if you look at the human jaw in comparison, but you can definitely see the movement in that particular shape direction. Now, another thing that we have talked about in some of these other episodes has been brain size. And as we've discussed, one of the trends we see in the hominins and especially in the genus Homo is an overall increase in brain size especially as the bodies are getting larger. So it's not only that the brain is getting bigger, but the ratio of brain size to body size is increasing as well. Um, we talked about Homo habilis on Friday, and they have a relatively small brain compared to Homo erectus. So this brain size is about 900 cubic centimeters. So two to 300 cubic centimeters on average larger than Homo habilis. So we're starting to see a larger brain, but it doesn't quite have the same size and same shape as a Homo sapiens brain. Um, one of the things that you'll notice is that Homo erectus kind of has sort of, you could describe it as like a football shaped brain. So it's more oblong than rounded and globular. 
Now, leaving the anatomy aside for a sec, let's talk about stone tool use in Homo erectus. When we discussed Homo habilis, we talked about the basic stone tool technology that they used. Uh, it's a type of stone tools called the old one tool technology. Homo erectus too has its own very unique style of tool making. It essentially grew out of the old one technology and it's a little bit more sophisticated, a little bit more advanced. And this is a tool technology called the Acheulean tool technology. And it's perhaps best known for something called the Acheulean hand axe. So these are starting to be more sophisticated tools that are good for chopping, for slicing into things. Um, they have sharp edges, so they're not quite as basic as we would see with the old Awan tool technology. And this becomes widespread. It's not just used by one pocket of Homo erectus, but instead it's used by Homo erectus throughout the world which indicates a little bit of sharing and exchange and movement between isolated populations, which is another reason why I think that Homo erectus is kind of cool. The last thing I'd like to talk about today is one of the things that I think makes Homo erectus the most fascinating. And that is that this seems to be the first species that has adaptations for endurance running. Now, when I tell people that our species and some of the earlier hominins seem to have been adapted for long distance running, the reaction I tend to get is, let's say, mildly skeptical. You know, people often think, oh, well, I don't like running long distances. I don't want to do it. I am not fit for it. I can't train. But in reality, we all have adaptations for this type of behavior. So it's something that we see in the hominin fossil record, and it really actually may have served an evolutionary purpose. Now, this hypothesis was first fully fleshed out in a 2004 article called Endurance Running and the Evolution of the Genus Homo. So if you're really interested in this topic or you're a runner yourself and you want to learn more, I really recommend seeking out this article. It's really easy to find a PDF online. Um, I just look for it and look over the evidence because there's a lot that the authors spell out in there. But basically the argument that they're making is that early members of our genus, beginning really with Homo erectus and then some of the later members of the genus Homo, including our own, have anatomical adaptations that make long distance running possible. The adaptations they point to have to do with four main concerns. So there are adaptations regarding energetics, so basically how the body uses and preserves energy during a long run. It has to do with skeletal strength, so basically how the bones keep themselves from breaking down when you're running long, long distances. It has to do with stabilization, so basically how we avoid falling over when we're running long distances on two legs. And then last but not least, thermoregulation. And thermoregulation, of course, is really important because as we're running, and if we're running miles and miles and miles, we are generating a lot of heat inside of our bodies, and we need to have ways to get rid of that. So Homo erectus is unique because it has a lot of these adaptations that for the first time we're seeing in the hominins. So for example, when it comes to energetics, one of the things that we see is that Homo erectus is starting to have such long legs, it's actually increasing the stride length, which is reducing the number of steps an individual would have to take to, um, to run a long distance. And so the fewer steps, the less energy an individual may have to expend. Um, another thing that we see starting in Homo erectus that the authors argue would really be helpful for long distance running are those expanded joint surfaces that I mentioned earlier. So if you think about it, when you run, you are generating a lot of force with every single foot strike. 
So you hit the ground with your foot and you can generate anywhere from two to four times your body weight in stress with every single step. So when this happens, you, your bones have to have a way to deal with it to avoid having stress fractures, to avoid having overuse injuries. And having widened joint surfaces in the knees, in the hips, in the feet, helps cope with this a little bit more. Another area that we see Homo erectus having some adaptations um, for long distance running is the presence of a nuchal ligament. So the nuchal ligament basically runs from the back of the head down to the shoulders. It seems as though that this nuchal ligament would help stabilize the neck during long distance running. And this likely first appears early on in the genus Homo. And then of course, last but not least, thermoregulation. Um, one of the ways that we help expend a lot of the heat we generate is through mouth breathing during heavy exercise. Um, another way is by having more sweat glands and less body hair. And in fact, there is some evidence, not from the skeleton, but actually from different groups of lice that points to the fact that hominins and specifically members of the genus Homo probably were starting to lose body hair beginning at about 3 million years ago. Now you may be wondering what this evidence is. Well, basically, human head lice and human pubic lice seem to have genetically separated at about 3 million years ago. Um, so looking at the genetics of these two groups of lice makes it appear as though they've become genetically separate groups likely because they couldn't move between the two areas of hair within the hominin body. So, kind of a little gross to think about, um, but it's also a really interesting way to approach a complex problem. All right, um, so that is where I'm going to stop today on that lovely note. Um, if anyone has any questions on Homo erectus or the evolution of endurance running, please put them in the comments below. Otherwise, have a great day, and I will see you all on Wednesday.